special thanks to my uh, committee members, uh, especially uh, people outside the time zone, like from India, Bipla was supposed to join. I don't know if he's online. Um, let me uh, introduce my committee members. Uh, my advisors are uh, 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 Professor Shed and Professor T.K. Prasad. Uh, I have uh, Dr. Payam uh, Bernagi from University of Surrey, uh, Dr. Kobes from Bootshop School of Medicine and uh, Detention Events. Uh, then I have uh, Dr. Corey Hansen, uh, who is from Bosch Research and Technology Center, Pittsburgh. Uh, then I have Biplav Srivastava, who is uh, uh, a senior research scientist at uh, IBM IRM, India Research Lab. And of course, uh, Professor Shagun Wong from NOICES. Uh, I would like to start my talk with a real world example. Uh, so how many of you remember the 2003 blackout that happened in the north east of uh, United States. That was a massive uh, blackout. So affecting around uh, 50 million people and like 6 billion in lost revenue. So such blackouts have happened in the past. Uh, and what do you think may be the reason? So the uh, basically the analysis was done. And uh, the investigation found that uh, uh, the, one of the main reasons, like one of the four reasons for failure was that there was a lack of maintenance of tree growth within the transmission right of way. So power grid is very well understood in, in terms of stability analysis. And there are transient stability uh, mechanisms. And there are a lot of simulations done to study the stability of a power grid. Uh, but do you think that was real world agnostic in this case? So when you put a power grid in the real world, there are not only internal events that you need to take care of, but also there are external events that influence this uh, power grid. And power grid is an example of a cyber-physical system uh, where there is uh, computation, uh, communication, and control. So those are the three Cs of a cyber-physical system. So one view of cyber-physical system was uh, uh, presented by uh, researchers at CMU. Uh, one of the main thing in cyber-physical system is that there are closely connected cyber and physical uh, components. And cyber-physical systems have been very popular and uh, well-studied, but it's a rel relatively new science. Uh, the question is, is this new science is just a combination of existing technologies, or is it completely new in terms of does it have a new science to it? So they present, a, a one, one, they present one approach. Uh, how do you go from physical processes to uh, efficiently dealing with such physical processes? So how do you? conceptualize a physical world. You probably, in cyber physical system, especially in this work, they come up with precise uh, mathematical formulas and math mathematical models to model physical processes. And once you have uh, modeled or captured the physical processes, you may have to find out what kind of optimizations you want to do and go back to the real world and uh, apply those kind of optimizations. So let me be, again, tied to the example that I gave you of the power grid. So the power grid has some stability analysis and stability equations. And there is some safe working zone for this particular uh, uh, power grid. So why were there not enough in this case? So just because I know how the system behaves in transient conditions, uh, that's probably good enough for me to understand the transient conditions. But uh, what is missing here? So I, this is a quote from uh, Albert Einstein. So he, he, he spoke about mathematical uh, equations, and he spoke about uh, its precision. So when mathematical uh, equations are given for a physical processes, it can't be never it can't be certain. But when it is uh, certain, they don't refer to reality. This, that's kind of the gist of what I'm trying to get at. So how, so if the equations don't really capture reality, what is reality? So let's take the example of power grid again. Uh, there are a lot more external factors influencing the functioning of a power grid. For example, in this uh, year of 2003, August 14, the temperature was like around 80s. So that was really hot, and people started using air conditioners at home. So because of that, the whole power grid was loaded, uh, it's overloaded, and then because of overloading, the conductors were hot. The transmission line conductors sagged below the uh, expected limit. And then the temperature may also have a direct cause on the sag itself, because when you heat a conductor, it might expand. 
similarly, there are many other events that would influence uh, power grid's operation. For example, if there are trees closer to the power grid, there might be flashover that may happen, and then the whole stability is lost within the system. So the question is, where do we have access to these external events? So one way to deal with external events is to see how valuable textual observations are. Here, I'm referring to something which is reported on uh, textual streams like social media. So there are three pictures that you need to look at here. The first one there, the first one uh, actually deals with uh, an event that was reported by a person, which is before even anything happens. So the, the, there is a problem, the person is unhappy that the power company has not taken care of that particular uh, uh, report that he had in the past. That's before the, uh, so this one is just before anything happens, before the incident. So this is during the incident. So somebody reports uh, a kind of tree fa falling on a power, a power line. And the third one is after the incident. So the power line was broken in the third one. So you can see that there are people talking about these different events and there is value to adding uh, citizen observations or textual observations in the context of cyber physical systems. Uh, here, it is power, here it is the power grid. So looking at all the three things, uh, the researchers at uh, Rutgers Univers University have developed a mobile application which can be used for reporting such problems to the power grid. So that's the third one I was talking about. Extending beyond power grids, there are a lot more events in a city and people talk about these events on social media. For example, uh, people talk about crime related events, uh, people talk about all uh, kinds of power interruptions, water quality, way, uh, sewage and traffic issues. So people talk about uh, traffic jams and delays in public transport vehicles. So, so what do I see, what do we see here in this case? So we see that there are physical components, uh, there are uh, things on the web, which is the cyber component, and uh, there are citizen sensors who are reporting observations. So here, social is used in a rather loose context, in the sense that I don't use any social theories to uh, integrate or do my analysis as of now, but I see a value going forward. Um, so what are the two characteristics of such a uh, system, which is PCS system? There are always uh, complexities here. That is, in the power grid example, you could never say uh, only you can you cannot restrict your set of events that can influence the power grid. There can be any number of events that you don't know might influence the power grid. So there may be many events. So there are there are complex the complexity in that case, and there are uncertainties in the sense that you don't know how these events are interacting with each other. So you don't know the connections between them. Beyond that. There are also uncertainties even within the observation context. For example, in case of sensors, you might have reliability issues. And in case of uh, textual or social observations, you may have trustworthy issues. I'll not be dealing with trust trustworthy issues and reliable issues here, but I do have worked in the past with Dr. Prasad on uh, trustworthy computing and things like that. So addressing these two, these two things, uncertainty and complexity. So, Graphical models, this probabilistic graphical models are a very good fit for this problem because they integrate probability theory and graph theory. So graph theory is to deal with complexity. That is, there may be multiple pieces that you want to study and you don't know how things are connected. So in that case, you have a graph to capture your intuition of connections. And probability theory is a calculus to deal with uncertainty. So if you're not sure about uh, certain aspects or certain events, you could capture it using uh, probability theory. So probabilistic graphical models are a good fit for this particular uh, problem of uh, PCS, which we, we see in uh, PCS. So I managed to confuse uh, some of my colleagues with this slide. They were asking what is inside the box. So basically, this, this particular slide refers to this slide here. So this is a specific example of a power grid, right? But we do want to abstract out and say, what are the events that are existing in PCS systems? So this is kind of an abstraction to think of events. So I'll just talk about, uh, so that's the first step. So we want to extract events, and then we want to understand how things are connected. So in the case of power grid, we want to understand how external events influence the power grid. That's not enough. 
So we have to come up with actions that people can take. Just because I extracted and I understand a domain, uh, it's not useful till somebody takes an action on the analysis that I have done. So actions are going to be a very important part. So considering those three things that I mentioned, extraction, understanding, and action recommendation, uh, we investigate the use of uh, probabilistic graphical models in the context of PCS systems for performing these three things. One is extraction, understanding, and recommendation. Those are the three uh, things that I'll talk about. So let's talk about those three things. So throughout the presentation, I'll give you uh, details of those three aspects that I just mentioned, which are important in the context of PCS systems. So first, let's go to extraction. So how do we extract events from PCS systems? So the technical uh, contribution in this particular uh, section is that uh, we have found a way to automatically create uh, training data sets using declarative knowledge on the web and use that data set to train some machine learning or statistical models and use it in the context of uh, PCS event extraction. Specifically, in this section, I talk about traffic event extraction, which is another cyber physical system, which I'll tell you why in the subsequent slides. City may have multiple uh, uh, departments, and I already showed you this slide. People talk about different events in a city. So I'll tell you why traffic analytics is a cyber, uh, PCS system. So we have a physical world, uh, for example, the map, it's not literally a physical world, but it's representation of a physical world. Then you, you have sensors monitoring the physical world. So in this case, you can see that there are red uh, markings on the map, uh, so which shows that there's slow moving traffic. Uh, it happened that there was an accident that happened in that location. So you can see that the accident being reported from a news agency. We also have the same incident reported on social media. So now you can see how three things come together in this particular uh, example. Uh, given that I've shown you the value of textual events in case of uh, PCS systems, uh, now I'll give you an extraction mechanism for extracting events from textual streams for traffic events. So here is the overall architecture uh, for extracting events uh, for textual, uh, from textual data. Now this is part of the ACM uh, transactions work that just got accepted. Uh, so there are two parts to this uh, problem. The first one is just the annotation. The second part is the extraction. So what do I mean by uh, annotation? Uh, I'll tell you what is annotation. Uh, we use a technique called conditional random field to annotate uh, different words uh, in a sentence. So what are, what are conditional random fields? Let's imagine, I'm going to give you an example, the inclusion first and then actually go into detail. Uh, let's say that you are uh, asked to label some images of a snapshot of a particular person's life. Here it's Justin Bieber. So, so what do you think is the label for the first uh, one? Sleeping? So what is the third? So let's label this one. So maybe it's driving. And the last but one picture is actually the picture of a uh, gymnasium. So what do you think is the last one? It's excising, right? So those are the possible uh, labels I can come up with. Let's take a different scenario. So here I have uh, similar images. OK, I'm labeling it as sleeping, driving. This one looks like a concert. So there are a lot of lights and things like that. So most likely, I'll say it's singing rather than excising. So now you've got the intuition, right? So you look at the sequence of events or sequence of words or sequence of images to come up with the label for the next one. So here, this particular image influenced the labeling of the next. So this intuition is captured in conditional random fields. So these images you can imagine as words in my problem uh, or tokens in my problem and uh, those red color sleeping, driving, and excising as the tags that I assign to each of those tokens. Uh, here are some details of conditional random fields, but I'll not go into a lot of detail. Um, one, one major advantage of conditional random fields is that they do a global uh, optimization. So you can capture dependencies within sentences that are long range dependencies. So in that case, uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, 
it's very well known for annotation tasks and it, it assigns a good good tags, for example. So here is an example of uh, annotation. So I have uh, so these are the tags. So instead of sleeping and exercising and things like that, I have uh, beginning of a location, intermediate location, beginning of an event, intermediate event, and other. So why do we have event and location? So in case of city events, those are the two important things we want to stress on. So we want to stress and find out what are the events and what are the location of those events. And the examples you can see, as you can see, the annotation is not really perfect. So it might miss out on some entities. Uh, the reason being that uh, the training data set we have is kind of uh, limited. And the kind of training data set we give to the model influences how it really performs on a test set. So you can see that uh, half moon uh, Bay Brewing, right? So it's a multi-token multi, uh, entity. So it's kind of named as location here. So we have accident as annotated as event. Uh, and similarly, accident as an event and block this an event. So this is an example of annotation that comes out of the CRF model. Now that we have annotated tweets, I'll go into the CRF model creation and evaluation of the model later. But before that, I want to give you some insights uh, how you can extract events from the annotated data you have. So there are three major uh, insights uh, that we gain. Uh, one is uh, if you have uh, a city and if you have grids that compartmentalize the city, so the spatial coherence plays an important role in uh, event extraction. So most likely, the uh, whatever happens in the grid is probably related to one event. If it's, re if it's reported at the same time. That's, these are the key insights and assumptions we make. And the temporal co coherence is, if there are entities reported, if there are events reported within a, a short time span, so most likely they are talking of the same event. And thematic coherence talks about uh, events, uh, or rather entities of similar kind will be mentioned for a particular event. So using these three assumptions, and I'll go into a bit more detail of compartmentalizing the city. So if you have uh, a large geographical area, you can split it into smaller parts. Uh, we use something called uh, geohashing. So this is an API where you can zoom in and zoom out of the location. So you can set the granularity of the bounding boxes that you want. Uh, if I increase the length of this particular string here, the more fine-grained you get. So there are uh, two algorithms that I'll present. The first one is related <coughs> to uh, annotation. So you can think of a raw tweet entering into this algorithm as an input. And the output is what I showed you, the annotations that I showed you in the past, slide, past few slides. So that is the first part. So in this, I need to spot locations. I need to spot events. right? So those are the two things. And then I also have to have uh, some other information embedded within the tuples that I create here. So algorithm one basically takes raw tweets and annotates it with events and locations. So let me go to the extraction algorithm. So this extraction algorithm uses three assumptions that I stated, key insights. Uh, you need not go through everything. You can look at the paper for explanation. But uh, the intuition is that we use the three key, the key ideas that I introduced to take all these annotations and then aggregate them into unique events, event tuples. And the event tuple would look like this. So events are com uh, comprised of types, location, start time, end time, and impact. So that's kind of the semantics we associate with events. And here are some sample events that we extracted from uh, Twitter. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the. Uh, impact is something like how significant the event is, but in this, in our case, we use something like uh, uh, how many counts of those particular event tuples you could find within a grid. So it's mostly you can think of like how widespread the event is, or how how many how, what how many people are talking about it can be a simple way of looking at it. How many types of event do you have? So I get uh, I'll talk about the details of types. Okay. Uh, I get a knowledge base from 511, uh, which has around uh, 800 types of traffic events. And I use that as a 
starting point. So these are types from that particular uh, hierarchy. Uh, then the location number that you see here, right, is just the geohash location. Uh, it's probably just a number assigned for a particular grid. So the evaluation we did, uh, the two algorithms that I proposed was uh, uh, evaluated in this context where I have uh, data collected for four months uh, from San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, the data comes from two sources. The one source is the Twitter event, Twitter uh, data set. Uh, we have around 8 million uh, uh, tweets for Twitter. And we also have 511 data, which is uh, 511 gives uh, incident reports. Uh, there can be two types of incident reports, active events and scheduled events. So 511 and Twitter data, those are the two data sources that we used in the evaluation. So Twitter data was used to extract events. And 511, since it's an authoritative source, we use those events as a way, uh, it's, it's a ground truth for us. So we use those events to compare it with what we extract from Twitter data. Uh, I'll keep the details of the evaluation and uh, also the training of the CRR, which I haven't uh, talked about yet. So here, are, here is a distribution of those uh, different events from 511. So this is not the event that I've extracted from Twitter, but this is just given to me. So you can see on the left side the active events and scheduled events. You can see how it is distributed over four months. So there are a lot more active events than scheduled events. And this gives a geographical spread of those uh, events. Uh, so here I'm giving you some details on how we are creating this uh, training data. So in the beginning of the section, I told you that uh, the, the major claim was that I use declarative knowledge to create massive training data set to train uh, machine learning or statistical models like Sierra. So how, how did we do that? So we take declarative knowledge, which is hierarchy in this case, the traffic hierarchy from 511. We've also taken uh, location names from OpenStreetMaps, and we use those two as an input, and we take uh, a dictionary-based spotting approach to create training data set from Twitter data. So we take tweets, and we spot entities just by looking at the dictionaries. That is, there are two dictionaries, right? One is the event names, the other one is location names. So we create uh, this particular uh, data set using that. And uh, before I go to the next slide, so here uh, we did an evaluation on 500 randomly chosen tweets to find out how well entities were spotted. So and it happened, so you can see the precision recall uh, curve and the precision recall measures for different uh, annotations. So because this is just not a classification problem, right? We have to look at how well the annotations were done. So we take these different uh, annot uh, these different uh, uh, labels and we find out how well we did for each of them. So now we created this massive training data set. And now, now we, are, we trained a CRF model to spot our entities. So there is a, we compared our approach with a baseline approach. So baseline approach works well. Uh, uh, in this case, so we saw that uh, it, it did perform uh, uh, well. And the difference is that we have uh, an advantage that we use declarative knowledge to actually create training data set that's specific to our task. So because of that, uh, we can we did better in terms of events. So you can see the I event. Uh, so we did better in terms of precision identifying the multi-word events. Uh, so because we had access to declarative knowledge, we could. Uh, do that. And one other advantage of this approach is that city events are very broad. So I'm just talking of traffic events here. But there may be multiple other events like sewage and water supply and many other domains. So if you have declarative knowledge for those domains, you could potentially generate data sets without uh, human involvement or without manual effort. So it's, it's, it's probably, that's one of the advantages of this approach. Sorry, so did you, you evaluated the automatically generated training data by hand? Yeah, like 500 of them, not so a, you did it best Just by comparing how closely the events seem to match up? Yeah, like, yeah, 500 of them, not not everything. We, we could generate like thousands of annotations, but we couldn't really verify everything. We took 500, 500 randomly sampled uh, tweets, 
and we looked at what kind of annotations were generated using the dictionary based plotting and we uh, basically evaluated how well it did in terms of identifying other uh, beginning of an event, intermediate event, beginning of an location and uh, intermediate location. Okay. So it was manual yeah, verification. I, see. Yeah. I must have missed something. I was referring to the automatically generated training data from the CRS model. Was that automatically generated training data validated too? So this training data was generated using dictionary based approach uh -huh. to start with and we used that data that was generated from dictionary based as a training for CRF model. However, uh, you would have to clean up the data set a bit because if you have to take advantage of CRS, if I just feed the dictionary based model then uh, it's probably not going to help much with the training. Uh, so we, we had to clean it up but uh, I, in this work I, I haven't done any cleaning. Okay. Did I answer your question? I think so. Uh, so did you uh, did you take care of the uh, yeah, did you did you come across any NLP issues in this, like in terms of tens of an event? Uh, because I'm sure you're not looking at events which are uh, like a year back or right. right so right, right. did you did you come across issues where you wanted to know just the events which are happening now? Because if you're looking at traffic, if you get to know a traffic right. jam happened three years back, that's useless for you or a year back or. Right, Not right, right. Like five, five hours back. Yeah, we circumvent that problem by taking the streaming API. So we don't look at older events, basically. But even in the streaming API, you get a lot of uh, people tweeting about older events. Right, right. But uh, we are limited in terms of what kind of vocabulary we want to use for traffic events by 511. So we don't get all the tweets. We filter out based on the entities. So at least I haven't seen that particular problem of coming across older events somehow. So if there is only one person talking of that older event, uh, the, uh, the spatial coherence would take care of it. Okay, okay. Uh, but if there are 20 people talking about an old event, then I don't think the system would catch that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's probably. If people talk about older events, then it's not sensitive to that. So this is just distribution of those events. I'll move forward, considering that I have. So we did. Uh, three kinds of evaluations on the data set we have extracted. Uh, so when you extract event from Twitter data, right, you want to understand what you have achieved. So in terms of complementariness, like did the events that you extract was really complementary to something that was already told or already you know about it uh, through some formal so, uh, sources. So that's the first kind of evaluation we did. Uh, second, uh, are, were they co are they corroborative? That is, is it supporting something that you already know? And the third one is early detection. So where I extract something from Twitter data and it was well before a formal source could report uh, this particular uh, event. So we did this three uh, analysis on the events that we extracted. So we extracted uh, uh, 1,042 total events from the 8 million uh, tweets. So you can see the number, like 8 million tweets to 1,000 tweets, uh, 1,000 events. Uh, and then it was collected over four months. So we do, how do we compare, right? So we have events from Twitter, we have events from 511, which is a formal reporting, which is the ground truth. How do we compare these two? So one way of comparing is you might say, okay, they might coexist uh, in time. So it, it may not be precise. It may not be just like 9 a.m. and 9 a.m. kind of matches together. It might be the range of values that you have to look at. So we looked at uh, uh, plus or minus 12 hours and 24 hours, like a duration of coexistence. Uh, and the second one was the spatial, uh, uh, pro the proximity of those two things reported. So people are mobile. Remember, they report events as they move around. So the, this kind of uh, spatial limitation of two, three, and four, five kilometers, we studied those, uh, uh, those three, uh, those uh, four things. So you can see the distribution of uh, different types of events. Uh, so here is an example of complementary event. So the green dot here. Uh, is actually reported from 511. The red is what we extracted. Um, so this is complementary in the sense that 511 reports construction, and we found that there is talk of traffic. I don't know if it's traffic jam, but people at least talk about traffic in that particular uh, location. Uh, and then we have construction here, and then uh, reported from uh, 511, and then traffic reported from what we have extracted. So that's, again, complementary. 
So I'll give you some example of collaborator here. Uh, we have uh, accident being extracted from both sources, Twitter and 511. And we have fog being extracted from both Twitter and 511. So in this case, it's supporting. One is supporting the other. In, in terms of timeliness, uh, we found that uh, we could find some events uh, before they happen. For example, concert here was reported before uh, the, sh the concert that was reported from 511. Okay, I've told you things about extraction till now, right? So I told you how do you extract events. So just because I know some PCS events, uh, I don't know what. Let, let me add one more thing. I think maybe uh, Pramod's uh, hypothesis was that the social uh, data does uh, add to the curated and censored sources that 511.org uh, has. And he basically analyzed the two and he showed that there are three different ways that the social media events are related to uh, what is out there. And so the three labels that he's come up with is how it relates. So, so it, in some cases it corroborates, some cases it is much more timely in the sense that we get to know it before it gets reported and the third one is uh, that it adds to what is already known. And sometimes it allows you to disambiguate. Yes. Um, Has there ever been a mismatch or, you know, the where it wasn't see, complimentary? That, that, that's a good point because we could extract a lot more events from Twitter data compared to a formal source, right? We don't have a ground truth to compare those events for which we don't know what is the real reality. So th that might be the case for the events that I haven't verified. So, yeah, like I don't, I, I restrict my, yeah, like fog is one other example. Like I restrict my analysis to those events that are related to city. So in that case, I'm avoiding some problems that are gen related to generic events. But still, that's a possibility that you can see that there's a phase difference between uh, the two. In a, in a broader kind of scale, uh, or from a vis vision perspective, if you may remember in the keynote, I particularly talked about multi-sensory and multimodal, uh, you know, uh, processing that our brains do, right? And so the whole idea is to go towards um, using multiple streams of data uh, and uh, uh, have much better awareness or situational awareness of anything that's happening than any one of the streams that can have. And the other point that I often make is that, well, we become good at just processing single uh, type of the data, video at a time, images at a time, text at a time. But our brains are much more powerful because we are able to consume all of these different modalities simultaneously, multi-sensory. This is our first kind of, you know, baby step in trying to do that where you could see the two of them actually coming together. Now, our challenge is to come up with uh, situations where we can do it even in a, instead of two streams or, you know, the there are primarily two streams here. There is a background knowledge here, um, and there is some level of web events here. But we want to look for even richer, uh, you know, events where we have multiple streams coming, and we are actually uh, uh, synthesizing this uh, yeah, in real time. And uh, in the summer, we will be starting to look at um, uh, much more doing it in real time aspects of it. Somebody from uh, uh, Italy is going to join us for eight six months. Yeah, okay. uh, along those lines of doing multimodal analysis, I'll give an example of asthma use case okay. where I have three pieces, right? Extraction, understanding, recommendation. So all those three things would come into play in one scenario that I'll present in the end. So, okay, we have, we know some events that we have extracted from social media. So what next? So first we need to understand before we do anything from now on. So how do we infer those associations between uh, events? So. In this particular uh, section, uh, I'll present some ideas on how do you infer associations when you have multiple events, and how do you do so when you have declarative knowledge about a domain. Uh, actually, I'll rush through this section and I'll present more uh, details in the next section where I have understanding, uh, sorry, the recommendation part of it. Um, similar to Power Grid, you have a road network, 
the red arrow there indicates propagation of an impact of a particular event. So there might be an accident here and the slow moving, the traffic might have just piled up on this road. Uh, the accident might have been caused by different other factors, right? So there are multiple external events that influence something in the physical world. So that is the kind of representation of uh, uh, what we have there. So how do we understand the connection between those two? So one particular uh, technique is to use uh, <coughs> Bayesian networks to uh, kind of find out how these different variables interact with each other. Uh, particularly, there is uh, we could use many structure extraction techniques uh, presented within the Bayesian network formalism. But uh, what is the major uh, drawback? So in case of Bayesian network, right, if I have two possible structures of a domain, both of them might be equally likely to be true, according to some of the uh, structure extraction techniques and some information theoretic measures. You, found, you find that there might be two structures which are different, but uh, they actually result in the same uh, score. They're equally likely. Uh, so in that in, in that case, how do we deal with such a scenario? So we we uh, hypothesize that declarative knowledge will be really useful uh, in such contexts. For example, uh, in the first graph there, you see cold weather is influencing poor visibility. The second one, you see poor visibility influencing cold weather. So somehow if you find this in the declarative knowledge, you know how to direct the arc. Uh, so that's kind of used to resolve the complexities within the network. So how, how is this actually done? Uh, in, 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 the, in practice, domain experts come up with those different structures that exist in a domain. Or it can be done by looking at data and learning from data. That's the second thing. So these are the two major ways of coming up with uh, structure as of now. But we propose that the declarative knowledge is also on the web. So people uh, reported and domain experts talk about or report uh, different uh, aspects of their domain knowledge on the web. For example, ConceptNet 5 has a lot of con uh, common sense related knowledge. It's very much complementary to all the semantic web efforts where there is linked open data, where there are factual information being uh, published. So this is more like common sense. What a person knows uh, generally and what machines need to know in, in a way. So here, that I'll, I'll go into the three operations that we perform on the graph. Uh, but basically the idea is to take these uh, declarative uh, knowledge and then put it back in the structure. Here is an example that I got from ConceptNet for traffic jam. So you can see how comprehensive the coverage is. So they talk about uh, different events and all those events, how do they influence uh, traffic, uh, traffic flow. So we used, uh, so here is what we extract from data. So maybe we can extract some correlations from data. Uh, and we propose three operations. So this is a workshop paper presented at uh, CM conference. Uh, we propose three operations to uh, do three things. One, we may we may be missing some nodes in the domain. So the declarative knowledge can provide us with new variables that we should be interested in. The second one is add or remove edges. So that the connections or the interactions between the variables might be uh, missing. So we, we use declarative knowledge connections to add those edges. And the third one is to direct the arcs. So the causal knowledge that is there on the declarative uh, uh, knowledge, which is concept net, we could use that to direct the arcs. So with this, I'll uh, move to the last part where uh, I'll be recommending the events. So we want to uh, just not analyze. So we, first we extracted, then we understood how different events are connected, and now we want to recommend events. Um, so here, uh, you can see that there is an example of uh, uh, flashover in the background. So there is a, so this is a one-shot decision. So basically, you compute some uh, number and say that, OK, this is one-shot decision. OK, I have to act on that particular information. We particularly think that declarative knowledge has a crucial role to play in, in the recommending actions part of it. Because actions are very much specific to the domain. Um, and within this uh, section, I talk about how do we trans
transform declarative knowledge of actions into a probabilistic model, which is the Markov decision process, and uh, this is used to recommend actions in the PCS domain. I'll describe each of them, uh, what is MDP and things like that in detail. So the context is that uh, this is in collaboration with uh, uh, Corey Henson, uh, who is on my committee. Uh, this is this work is uh, my internship work at Bosch. Uh, so here I talk. Uh, so the action recommendation in uh, PCS system would look like this. We want to provide step-by-step -step instructions to accomplish a task. So this particular example was in the context of IoTS network, where you want to do some simple task and you want to get step-by-step -step instructions. So let's say you want to make uh, French toast. So now you have step-by-step -step instructions to uh, do this particular uh, uh, dish that you want. Uh, so Snapguide is a big company now. They have raised $10 million and they have 1 million users who are contributing to such step-by-step uh, -step instructions. Even Google has caught to this kind of uh, thing. So they want to provide step-by-step -step instructions and then instead of providing you with web pages, they would as well give you step-by-step -step instructions. Maybe they've got it from some other place, but still they're moving towards that. So what do these things look like? So they are basically static maps. So if I give you a static map of uh, data and ask you to navigate, so you may end up making some mistakes, but still you have to compute yourself as to how you can retrace and achieve a particular target or goal. Um, so these two things compare to that. But for action recommendation, we want something that is uh, uh, very much receptive to changes in the environment. For example, if I make a mistake, uh, in, in while, I'm, while I'm taking actions, then I want the system to come back and give me recommendations that is appropriate for me uh, at that particular point. So I talk about three things in this section, in action recommendation. One is, can we represent actions in a particular domain? And can we do so with uh, using uh, semantic semantics, uh, or a formal approach like semantic web? So the idea, or idea here is that we could reuse the existing knowledge uh, uh, when we use semantic web and shareability and other uh, aspects are uh, uh, played to our advantage. So we want to, once we represent the task, can we recommend tasks? That's the second, second question uh, that I'll be addressing. So within that, I'll talk about uh, MDP-based uh, formalism. And specifically, I'll talk about how do you go from knowledge of actions to a MDP. So one is declarative knowledge, the other one is a probabilistic model. So how do you make this switch between those two? Uh, the third one is an evaluation framework. So now that we recommend tasks, how well are we doing it? So we don't know how to evaluate such things. Maybe in case of asthma, for example, we could have a verification as to how many patients had uh, reduced attacks based on our recommendation. Uh, so that's... Uh, I'll also talk about a simulator that kind of simulates this uh, the dynamic environment in the third part. So here is the overall architecture of uh, action recommendation. So I have task representations. Then I have a module that takes the task representation and recommends tasks. And I have a world state simulator which ret uh, reports back what is the world state after you take an action. So let me discuss the first part, representation of tasks. So that's the part that I'll be discussing. So here is an example of task representation. So tasks here have some preconditions and effects. So to, in order to perform a task, you might require some resources. For example, if you're making French toast here, you might uh, need egg and milk to make egg butter, for example. So you can represent tasks by these units, but, and each unit has a precondition and an effect. So each of them is a task. So a simple recommendation of task may look like this. So I might give actions to the user, uh, and it's just a simple uh, sequence. So this is very easy to follow, and it's also easy to create by the users. And this is, uh, but however, this is not responsive to environmental changes. So for example, the Google step-by-step -step instructions, that particular system doesn't know if I make a mistake. So there should be a way to factor in the mistakes uh, that are uh, done in the real world. And the environment is dynamic, so we need to account for that. So here the precondition is just the completion of the task. That is, if I have to recommend a second task, 
the first task has to be completed. That's the only prerequisite. Uh, Pramod? Ah, yeah. Hi, Bipla. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you a quick question. Yeah. Which was that, uh, is it possible for you to give an example of uh, uh, action, keeping in mind the mm -hmm. original uh, example that of an event extraction, so the original yeah. extraction you were doing mm -hmm. was from traffic or from uh, uh, other activities, right? Right. So right, right, right. What did the action the yeah. mean in that context? Right? Yeah, that's a very good point. In fact, uh, when I was uh, interning at uh, with you, right? So we had this IRL transit, which is basically a route recommendation system, right? So there, the action is basically you recommend a particular route to the user based on the source and destination. So those are the sequence of actions that you actually recommend in that context. So how good, how well would your uh, uh, sorry, I was speaking on uh, mute. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can hear you. So uh, my question to you was, how do you, um, how do you evaluate how good your recommendation was in this kind of context? Uh, because, um, right. uh, so are you, uh, so, so the, the, the reason I'm asking this question is, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the typical kind of, um, uh, if, if you had the, all the information together, right, then right. you would have, uh, you, uh, you could have guaranteed Right. That yes, uh, right, my right. recommendation is will take you to the goal that you were desiring. Right. Now, in right. this kind of information where you have partial information, right, what this user might be interested in. Mm -hmm. So, my question to you is, how will you evaluate? Right. Uh, so, I'm, again, I'm just connecting the three parts of your thesis. Right. So, right. you have identified an event. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, uh, you are uh, uh, correlating it with other information. Right. And then you're trying to take on it. Right. So my question right. to you is, how would an evaluation of the, that the, the action is the, the correct recommendation um, would be done here? Uh, so so in, what's it there? Right, right, right. So in this context, uh, the evaluation can be uh, two types. One, whether the goal was accomplished by the user, first thing. And second thing, how many mistakes the user made. So I'll give details on those two things when I uh, talk about the evaluation framework, the third piece I had within the action recommendation. So maybe uh, you can look at that explanation that I give and uh, maybe we can revisit this question then. Okay, sure, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So here, uh, so here we have a couple of uh, tasks and here we are representing it with preconditions and uh, effects. So the advantage of such an approach is that there's flexibility in the ordering of these tasks, right? So that's kind of uh, the thing. So reuse, uh, reusability is, uh, is an advantage when we use semantic web framework. So we represent each of those resources with URIs. So now that I have URI, I need not recreate those resources if I'm already using the like, entity-based, like tree-based. Um, so what is, uh, so for, let's say you have uh, available resources as eggs, uh, milk, and that's a fork. So let's say you have those uh, as available resources. And uh, now the action recommendation engine would encounter this particular action. So can you recommend that action looking at the preconditions? So if you look at an exact match, then this precondition is not really satisfied because I don't have a whisk. So this is a whisk. I don't have it in the available resources. However, bringing in uh, external knowledge like Freebase would let us evaluate such preconditions and then uh, we could actually present that task to the user. Uh, within the language of actions, we should be able to extend it. So it's just an example of uh, adding new tasks. And uh, within uh, tasks, there might be complex tasks and you might want to break down into smaller tasks. So depending on the actions the user can perform, you may want to break down the actions and then give out actions that are uh, uh, on par with what the user can perform. So uh, the, I, I'll talk about uh, details in the next uh, few slides about uh, the recommendation itself. Um, so I'll talk about task recommendation in this uh, section. Uh, so 
Planning has been a well studied topic. Uh, uh, actually, Biplav has uh, his PhD in planning. Uh, and uh, basically, there are two uh, major approaches one is classical planning, the other one is uh, planning under uncertainty. Uh, in case of classical planning, uh, there, are, there are HTN planners which decompose the task and they execute from left to right. However, for uh, domains that are very dynamic, right? It's very hard to uh, just stick on to uh, one singly computed plan. So we have to adapt as we go. So in this work, I'll be talking about, uh, to address the dynamic and non-deterministic nature of the domain itself, I'll be using the Markov decision process uh, in this case. So let me give you an example of uh, an MDP here. So a Markov decision process has six states and actions that you can take and this is the transition probability. What does that mean? So transition probability means that if I am at a particular state and I take an action, how likely I'm going to end up successful with that particular uh, state transition. So let's say you're in a slippery environment in this case. So there is 80% chance that I'll uh, uh, get the intended action applied in the real world. So let's compute this. So uh, if, I'm, uh, if I want to go from start to goal state, so what are the sequence of steps I need to take? I need to say up, up, right, and right, and right, right? So those are the three rights and two ups. So that's a deterministic word. So if you compute the likelihood of reaching that particular goal, it's very less. So stochastic domains uh, have to be co considered and static plans don't work in stochastic domains. So similarly, I just give you an example of what is policy. So these were hard to understand for me when I was trying to deal with MDPs. Uh, for example, state and policy. So if I have to look at these, uh, how do I look up the policy? So I look up the state, which is state eight, and what is the task I need to perform? I look up corresponding uh, policy, so which is up. So I just follow that and then uh, the likelihood of me reaching the goal is uh, higher there. So let me revisit the problem of action recommendation. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the sequential uh, problem, right? So this is uh, at every step I need to uh, recommend the best action that I can take. So it's a sequential decision problem. And the next step, the next action that I'm going to uh, recommend depends just on the evaluation of preconditions. Now how I achieve that precondition, uh, it's immaterial. It just depends on the current state. So it's a Markovian transition. And we observe full observability. That is, we don't know, uh, we don't account for any hidden variables. And every time we are progressing towards the reward, that is, for achieving the final goal. So this is why we use Markov decision process for solving this uh, task recommendation in uh, domains that are dynamic. So this applies to, uh, in general, to domains that are stochastic and dynamic uh, in nature. So now coming to the declarative knowledge of actions. Uh, how do I transform this declarative knowledge of actions uh, into something that's uh, probabilistic in nature, which is MDP? So I have declarative knowledge consists of states, right? So the resources in the environment. Then I have uh, tasks that can be performed. And what are the effects the task has on the resources? So. You can focus only on these two things here. So uh, the two matrices are very important. One is the transition probability matrix. You need to give this as an input for computing the policy of MDP. And the cost function. Those are the two things. So what is transition probability? So we define transition probability as a success the user may have at a particular task. And that is directly proportional to this particular probability here. So the transition probability is related to the success the user has. And each action may have some cost. So that is the cost function. So for example, you might need a need lot more resources for a particular task uh, to be performed versus there may be simpler task with lesser number of resources. So let me uh, address Biplow's uh, question of uh, uh, task recommendation and then talk about how do we evaluate it. So the evaluation is. Uh, should be fair in the sense that we have to compare how well we did the recommendation. So if there are multiple recommendations, how do they compare against each other? And we need to consider the world states and transitions. 
So this is probably what Bipla was referring to because we don't really have access to all the stochastic nature of the, uh, of the world. We can only simulate it. Or we should have experiments set up and then we should simulate it, which has a lot of cost. So we take a simulation based approach. So I present to you a stochastic simulator now, uh, which can model stochastic environments. For example, uh, stochastic environments can be something like uh, uh, dynamic I IOTS kind of network that is here, or it can be something like, say, if you want to simulate asthma attacks in a person. So we could potentially model the environmental aspects as stochastic in nature, and then we can use this simulator in the context of uh, asthma for simulations, if we don't have uh, real data sets. So are all the uh, events stochastic in nature? No, not all. Like well, if you, like for example. Or, or at least uh, all the events you're trying to model are stochastic in nature? No, not all. Not all of them are stochastic. For example, throwing a die, right? That's stochastic. Right. So, like similar to that, uh, not not every event is like stochastic. In nature. So in your, in your MDP, does it account for situations where maybe the order with which you do some tasks mm -hmm. may not matter? Right? So like right. baking French right. toast, like it doesn't matter if I get the eggs first, it doesn't matter right. if I get the bread first, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Um I guess from the from the figures though, if like there was a very specific um like if you go go forward two, I guess. Forward? Sorry. Well you can take just take any of these, but it seems right, like you right, have to right. do one and then you have to do the next and you have to do the next. But it could be the case that you could have like an or condition, right? Right, right. Like uh, for example, with the precondition based task ordering, as you said, it's flexible. So I can perform one task. Uh, the ordering doesn't matter actually. If the preconditions are satisfied, uh -huh. I can pretty much switch to any task for which the precondition is satisfied. And so that, and that's reflected in the MDP. Right. In MDP, right, the way it, it's even more flexible. So we have to restrict it a bit in the sense that in MDP you can take any state transition. Right. But here we have this restriction of precondition, however, right? So we can't just do any task, but those tasks that have precondition satisfied for a particular state that we are in. So MDP allows you to make transitions from current state to any state, uh -huh. but we have to restrict it. Right? We have to restrict the expressivity there in a way. For, for me, the more exciting thing, and correct, uh, if you want to add or correct me, if you know, feel free to do so, is the fact that. Um, when you have, uh, when you reach, um, you can model uh, that uh, how to make a French toast and many other things, um, and including the fact that if you don't have uh, the risk, what do you do? What are the alternatives? Right. Are you can all model in MDP. What is more exciting is the fact that at the time that the precondition that having a risk is not satisfied, your ability to then, uh, um, uh, in fact. Uh, to refer to uh, Freebase and say, well, uh, the risk is uh, an instrument of this type, uh, and what other instrument of that type is there, right. and if that instrument of that type, uh, like fork, is available or not. Right. So uh, you, you, this is an excellent example of use of background knowledge, which um, uh, makes this thing a lot more practical in the real world. So think about if you had only MDP, and um, uh, you did not have this background knowledge, then what do you do? You can model the whole thing, but you never come up with a solution because the real world is not that rigid. Right. And this is the process. This is yeah. another, um, you know, excellent example of what we have been focusing on, what I've been telling almost all of you to do is to use the background knowledge to improve um, a learning systems, stochastic system, uh, NLP systems, and that most of you are doing there, right? So, and now uh, to this, you need, do need to add even additional level of um, uh, challenge and comp complexity. Well, well, here you say, well, I have free base available. In the real world, in the you know, to build even more um, uh, flexible systems, you would need uh, the ability to get to uh, what would be the most relevant knowledge that may uh, allow me to get to that. So the, you know, you, know you, you could put theoretically combine what Sarasi was looking for, saying, well, there are all these knowledge sources, uh, which one is the most relevant one that I would use. So. Uh, you know. Yeah. Um. Ah, yes, people. Hi, yeah. yeah. So I, I have a suggestion here. Ah, okay. yeah. Uh, which is that uh, uh, what you are uh, planning to do uh, is really uh, uh, planning, generating the plan. Okay. Uh, right. In, in probabilistic, uh, there are multiple approaches, and you you right. know about them. Right. 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 Uh, yeah. Right. And they are pretty sequential. Okay. And some right. of the 
examples could be, uh, you know, uh, you're giving a set of instructions about what to do if the flu season is coming, right? Take precaution, mm. get vaccine shots, something's very sequential, okay? Similarly, uh, what should I do if uh, someone is searching for, uh, you know, initial first stage cancer, right? Some steps on that. Mm. So, my, so in these kind of situations, there is an India called plan recognition, mm. okay? Which is, from the events, you are trying to figure out what is this person's overall goal, okay? Mm -hmm. What is one or two actions that you're seeing, right? Which are the events you're noticing. Right. From that, you are trying to understand what is his potential set of actions and what is his uh, intended goal. Okay? okay. And this is, um, so what happens is, your job, you have a library of uh, plans and the goals that they will achieve. Mm -hmm. Right. You would try to, you know, pick up that, okay, this guy seems to be doing, liking this, and so I will suggest these are the future actions, right, and he will achieve that goal. Oh, okay, so is it like so, characterizing the um, different planning algorithms and then figuring out where it's sequential, where it is not, and characterizing them to kind of recommend those specific type of planning algorithms? No, so it's not algorithms. I see. You okay. know ahead of time. So, so think of, uh, so do a search on uh, plan recognition. Yeah, okay. okay. And in the thing that I was telling you, uh, it could be like in the health domain, right? Yeah. Uh, what you should be doing if you have uh, initial stage of cancer, if you have uh, uh, smoking, uh, you know, uh, or a heart attack uh, prevention of certain things. Right. So, a set of action fragments or plan fragments. Yeah, okay. And based on uh, the activities or the events that you're observing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You make certain recommendations. So, plan recognition as okay. a way of recommendation is quite robust to in this kind of uncertain domain. Okay. So, my okay. what I'm suggesting is that what, uh, what you have planned, right, right, is good. Okay. But as an alternative, and uh, if if, uh, mm -hmm. if it allows, or maybe uh, if you think which one which one is promising, mm -hmm. maybe uh, trying them could be a very good. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Yeah, and see if, 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 whether uh, that could be applicable. I think it should be. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I want to step back a little bit. I'll just. send you some uh, uh, references on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Thanks. I, I just want to summarize and I think step back a little bit. So, so what is the original problem? The original problem is that we have an initial state and a final state is given to us. Right, in this case. Yeah. Right, and right. then we need to discover a... Uh, a sequence of tasks to be accomplished right. to get from one to the other. Right. And it is possible for one to have multiple ways of accomplishing that task. Right. Right. Yeah. right? And each yeah. particular path is sequential, but there are multiple ways of doing it. Right. And also there are uh, two things that I mentioned. There are uh, chances of failure. The person might fail a particular task. So how do you account for that? So will your plan change if the person continuously fails at a point? Uh, and then there are uh, Resources, like each task may require some resources or some cost associated with that. So how do you optimize these two things, like transition and cost? Right. And, and also that risk uh, example basically said, it seems to imply that we are over-specifying the precondition. Right. And what yeah. we need is an ability to... To kind of uh, flexibly... Like, right, and, and so kind of step back, yeah. like abstract, and then yeah. get more specific. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just I'll describe uh, quickly what... Uh, stochastic simulation I used. So, this is a bad way to present, but I have a next slide which <laughs> has some pictures to summarize this. Um, basically, I want to tell you that this is the language where you specify the stochastic nature of an environment. This is called RDDL. Uh, I'm sure Biplow would have worked with it a lot. So, it's called Relational Dynamic Influence Diagram Language. Um, you can specify stochasticity in the environment based on some variables and state transitions. So now, going to the picture, which is a lot more clear. So what does it mean? So what do you, what do you specify? So let's say you have a state. So thus, did this particular language, RDDL, will tell you how to make this, uh, or rather, what is the state transition? So if there is milk, it continues to stay. So that is the kind of transition. This line means that. 
So this is from the previous uh, slide. So again, if there are eggs, they remain. Most likely they remain is unless somebody breaks it. So there might be some stochasticity there. You could capture that if you want. So this particular line from the previous slide means that, so if there is, if there is no egg batter in the environment, that still continues to be true. But if there is egg batter, there are two ways. One, the egg batter already existed in the environment. That's why you have, it's continued to be in the environment. Or somebody has created the egg batter, which requires some resources and there is some possibility of failure. Uh, maybe if the person is performing for the first time or things like that. So you can capture state transitions between uh, uh, different states and specify what kind of stochasticity you want to capture in your uh, thing, uh, in your uh, state transitions. So do you have to account for all the possible transitions in this? Do you have to know all the possible states it can go to? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes, you need to know the states. Uh, you, so for example, MDP, right, is another, uh, there are there's something called infinite uh, space MDP. So maybe that doesn't require all the state specifications. Uh, so Diplo can correct me if I'm wrong on that because I'm not planning person. But there are infinite sequences that you can model. But in this case, you need to know what are the state transitions. But the stochasticity somehow captures things that you don't know. So you can capture the success of a particular task using that particular probability there. So how do you learn those? You have to learn it from a user or maybe from domain expert, like Dr. Phobis can tell us when would an asthma attack could probably happen and things like that. So I just, I just I told simulator and I just gave you the language, right? So what is a simulator? So I take the RDDL representation in the first slide I had, then I have policy. So in that robot example, I had a, a list of numbers. So that's nothing but the policy. So I take what action to be what is the best action to be performed at a particular state. So that is the policy. I take <coughs> these two as inputs. Then I use the, the RDDL simulator to generate state transitions and also uh, rewards are a way to find out how well you did when you are uh, reaching a goal. Um, so lastly, I want to come up with uh, an, an application scenario where all the three things come together. So today I discussed extraction, understanding, and recommendation. So we see that we are excited about uh, K-Health Asthma project because all the three things are kind of required for this uh, project. Uh, Pramod, before you move into K-Health, yeah. a quick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead. So in the beginning of your presentation, you, talked, you showed um, this example with uh, Justin Bieber. Yeah, right, right. So you showed how If you can detect that Justin Bieber is in a, in a concert hall, um, then he's probably singing, but yet if he's in the gym, then he might be working out, exercising. Right, right. right. In, in the first two phases of your research, you showed how you can detect these events, and then you can understand the relationships between the events. Right. So I would say that what you're doing is perhaps learn context information, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. And, and then we could perhaps use this context information to provide recommendations, recommended actions to Mr. Bieber. Mm. So in right. the first case, right. I might say, you know, he should pick up a microphone. In the second case, he should pick up a dumbbell. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Action recommendations are always contextual. They always depend on what's going on in the user's environment. Right, and also strongly depends on the declarative knowledge of the domain, like what is the set of actions to be performed in the domain itself. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. In fact, uh, I had the, you know about the work, like the state transition matrix and the cost, right? It kind of captures the context, but I haven't explicitly stated it as user context. So maybe that's one thing to, uh, one task item for me to do. So I think um, moving towards maybe what you have a real opportunity here to tie these together. If you can show how mm -hmm. events that you're being that you're detecting and understand right. can influence your recommendations a little bit. Ah yeah, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Good. Yeah. Um so I'll show how these three things come together, but uh, just quickly it's already past one hour, so 
So here we have uh, uh, asthma is a very complex problem, and then you can ignore rest of it. But this three things here: one is extraction. So we need to find out what events are really relevant in the context of asthma. So in the sense that what physiological observations do you need? What environmental observations do you need? What public health kind of an, uh, observations do you need? Then you need to understand how they are connected. And then you need to be able to make some predictions on risk category, for example. Uh, and you have to recommend actions to the user for uh, corrective actions. Uh, so those, these are the, this is a question that uh, asthma patient may have. So in the previous uh, slide, you saw this recommendation. So how, how does the recommendation uh, is actually done? How is, how is it done? So we have a model. Then we can have simple uh, gradations on the probability of, let's say, a person being in a risk, particular risk category. So these are the three risk categories. And a domain expert should actually tell us what action to be performed. We can't come up with actions without knowing deep enough the domain itself. So this is more of a vulnerability thing. So this is like a prediction. So now, you know, so in the previous slide, you saw that there was, uh, uh, so we are doing this uh, computation of the risk category, and then the risk uh, category is actually as an input to this uh, prediction, where I have uh, vulnerability prediction. And uh, we are doing, uh, we are having collaborations with Dr. Forbes for over two years, and uh, uh, I hope to use this kind of complete framework of extraction understanding and recommendation within the Atma context. So to summarize, uh, for these three uh, pieces, uh, for PCS uh, uh, analysis, I have uh, presented to you, uh, these, these are the computational contributions. Uh, and the green ones are the publications that I, I have. And the red ones are the planned publications. Um, uh, so basically, in the event extraction part, I gave you how valuable citizen sensor observations are. And how do you extract it in the context of PCS event? That's the first thing. Second thing is that uh, once you extract these events, how are they connected? So I gave you some preliminary ideas on how do you, you do that, do so using uh, uh, statistical models, and then how do you complement them with existing knowledge of the domain? And the third one, I spoke about uh, action recommendation uh, in the context of uh, PCS systems. So this is a tentative. Uh, Timeline. So I'm working on uh, a paper which uh, I'm planning to submit to UAI, uh, Uncertainty Team AI. Uh, this this particular first paper deals with the two aspects here uh, in a deeper way. So currently I have some preliminary results there. Uh, the the second one is about uh, task recommendation, uh, where I have to write up the work. So work is pretty much done, but I have to position it and write up the work. Planning to submit to Ichikai. Um, International Joint Conference on AI in 2015. Uh, it's February, February is the deadline. And uh, the third deli deliverable, I'm uh, thinking that there should be a complete system for extraction, understanding, and recommendation in the context of ASMA. So a prototype which can perform all the three uh, things. Uh, here are my couple of publications, and then uh, these are planned publications to be. Uh, I would like to thank all my uh, committee members, uh, especially for their uh, continued support and patience, and all the discussions and all the uh, valuable suggestions that I've got till now. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot to my committee members. Uh, I would also like to thank KHL team, uh, uh, and also Wahid, uh, right here, and all my friends uh, at the system. Thank you.
can right. that be incorporated as a part of yes. it? But you were saying earlier that those known task actions mm -hmm. are already, uh, I mean, known to you. So then if what happens when this, you know, external knowledge base comes to tell you an alternative of right. the task right. right, right. There are two questions, right? First one, I switched between domains to, ex to make my point, and then I finally told that Asma has a promise of where they have access to all the data sets. Right, so, so in the first case, that would be a good example of action. Right, right. If, uh, in your first question, um, actually I don't have time, but I did have uh, action recommendation in the context of uh, route recommendation. So this is my 2011 uh, work, I think you're familiar with that, where there were some traffic events, those events, oh, 2012 work actually, Th those events um, would influence route recommendation in a way. So there's a complete process there. There is extraction of events, and there is understanding that what events influence what uh, particular uh, public transport bus stops in, in, in context of Delhi. And the third one was, how do you recommend routes now that you know what stops are affected. So the, there's a complete cycle there, but I did not have time, like I had to cut down on such things because uh, a lot more uh, other things were present. That's your first question. Second question is, uh, in terms of uh, declarative knowledge, as you said, it's very, it's valuable. Uh, and I demonstrated that by one simple thing, which is the precondition based uh, satisfaction of a particular uh, recommendation of a task. So in that case, we could offer some flexibility when we had external knowledge. Uh, Dr. Shit uh, probably said the same thing, right? So we have, if we just stick on to what preconditions exist with a particular task and do an exact match, we might end up not recommending the task. But when you have external knowledge, now you have a bit more flexibility. You can say that, for example, uh, here you could see that whisk and fork, both of them can be used as a beating device, as an egg beating device. So in that, that kind case, of it's not restricted. That means the known action right. may not be restricted to the, uh, that this is the only site that I'm going to use. The everything thing is the right? action, but the affordances of these different resources change. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's so perhaps that's you should say with the precondition, say that's the one, so regardless of having the action will change based on the mass action. Right. I have a couple of things if you want. Yeah. So, uh, uh, one thing is, uh, how have you or how are you planning to evaluate the task recommendation? Um, so, in case of uh, the particular examples I provided, right? Right. So, one of the evaluation is <coughs> that how successful, or for example, if you're Ask if you are given instructions to perform a particular task, you can do two kinds of evaluation. One is based on time, so how quickly you could do it. But that's very subjective, right? So it might change uh, based on my experience and things like that. So that's one evaluation, the time that the person takes from starting point to the goal. That's one evaluation. The other evaluation is uh, how, how many times the user failed. So that shows that your recommendation was not good because there is some contextual information to be captured, like Corey mentioned. So if we know the user context uh, and also his environmental context, so we can combine those two to give action recommendations. So if we have to evaluate our action recommendation, it has to be in place. That is, how good did I recommend? So number of failures the user faced before he reaches the goal. So that's one possibility that I can think. Can I add to that? For Asthma, at least it would be using the domain expert, right? Right, right. In the different uh, context, context yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends on the domain, but probably I was referring to this example here. Uh, in the same thing, right? How do you? How did you map your, uh, okay, it's, uh, did you do it automatically? Did you automatically map your uh, preconditions to pre-based concepts or? No, it was not automatic. It was, done manually. For this particular hand-coded example, it was manual. Okay. The, the, at, at Bosch, I think, uh, Cody might be able to tell more about that. They do some automatic extraction and things like that. And, okay, this, my last question. Uh, what's the, uh, what's, what's the main difference between the Messierov model you created and the baseline CRF model? Uh, yeah, I, I might have missed it, so. No, no, actually, uh, there is no, uh, 
there is no difference in the sense that both of them are linear chains here. So that is, the tags that I have, huh. the dependencies are only between the adjacent tags, and the tokens I have may have arbitrary dependencies on the tags. So it's the same. Both of them are linear chains here. Yes. The, the difference is that they put a lot of manual effort to create their CRF model. But their CRF model still works fine. They, it, as in the evaluation, you saw that they could recognize all the locations even better than uh, what we created. But they missed out on domain-specific <coughs> things. For example, events. So they couldn't recognize all the multi-word uh, traffic-related events. They couldn't recognize locations within San Francisco. They missed out on uh, some facilities and things like <coughs> that. So, but what was it trained on? Which one? The model. The my model or their model? Their model. They you uh, it's work by Alan Ritter. Oh, so okay, okay. So yeah, you yeah, compared. Uh, yeah, like basically, uh, they miss out on some domain-specific events. Yeah, oh, so that's the only advantage I have. Yeah, I think. I no, think actually, I'll take it back. That's one advantage. The other advantage is that we don't use any manual uh, effort in creating the training data set. We just automatically create the training data set. If you so, in our case, it happened that our CRF do, performed. I don't think even they manually do it, right? No, it was manually done. You can see their. Uh, uh, they use some existing corpus. Maybe they didn't do it. They have some part of speech chunking. Right. And they have some other data set. I don't know if they use some existing ones. Uh, but in our case, we automatically create the training data set. In our case, it happened to be enough. But uh, technically, you can clean that and even make it better. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, let's ask. Uh, no. Hello? Uh, does any of the committee members have any questions on the handout? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Well, actually, I have two. Yeah. Uh, one minor and one that I think is fairly important. Uh -huh. the, the minor first. Um, so there is, a, there is a joint project now between MIT and Google mm -hmm. where they are taking semantically annotated tasks extracted from the web uh -huh. and converting them to MVP. Oh. If you want to write about this now, there's competition, and you will have we'll have to do a comparison. Yeah, okay. I think we really have a good story about how we're integrating context information. That right. can be the key di differentiator. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. That that's the first thing. Um, oh, okay. The other thing is, so you 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 tell this story about how domain knowledge can be used to improve. Probabilistic models, right? And you get three cases: you know, uh, detection, understanding, recommendation. Right. In, in, in these three, you show how that's the case. How you use some declarative models to improve the probabilistic inferencing that you're doing, right? Right. So I, I think this is a good story, but I think it's not a complete story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes, probabilistic models can improve or background knowledge can improve probabilistic models, but at the same time, probabilistic models can influence and improve domain knowledge as well. And I think okay. mm -hmm. Mike, so Mike Bergman had a, an article a few weeks ago where he calls this the virtuous cycle between uh, knowledge bases and uh, uh, AI. Yeah, oh, okay. And I tend to agree that if we can understand the feedback loops mm -hmm. of different representation models so that they improve each other, right. then it's a much stronger um, integration than just the one way that, that you're talking about. That's not to say that you have to do this for your research, but I think you need mm -hmm. to understand it. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, yeah, um, describe it as part of this overall integration between the two frameworks. Yeah, okay, yeah. So in our case, uh, for example, context is what you refer to as background knowledge, which we probably glean from the observations we collect. Is that the kind of uh, probabilistic knowledge that you want to put back to declarative? Um, perhaps, but um, you mean 
as you say, you can learn from the data. Right. From the probabilistic models, you can re learn relationships between events. Maybe you're learning relationships that were unknown previously. Right. Also right. relationships, partonomical relationships, these kind of things that maybe are common sense um, that you can then push back to the models. Other, also, you can maybe detect errors within the models or, or other right. things. Yeah, like right. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think I remember Sujan's work. I, I think the, uh, the virtuous cycle and I think the uh, uh, thing of enhancing the knowledge itself, uh, uh, doing, doing that will be taking away from this particular work. It will be a lot more, you know, uh, so probably the best we can do is to recognize it as a, uh, you know, future work or that would have the such possibility that exists. I doubt that you can, because that will take you to kind of the same things that Topher was trying to do and, uh, you know, I think right now you probably are more knowledge user than the one that uh, would do that. Uh, my, my, my worry is that the uh, agenda that is right now there is uh, too broad and uh, how to tell the story very well is going to be a challenge still. Uh, so Cory has, I think you did, uh, you did fantastic job in storytelling, um, in, in capturing it in, uh, um, the presentation you had and the defense you had. It's, it needs to be at that level. It needs to be that kind of chunk. Uh, uh, anything much larger would become unwieldy and you can't, you won't be able to have cohesion. So then you'll be kind of going on the side trips. Uh, on the other hand, recognizing this and has a potential, absolutely a good thing of that. Uh, just the developing techniques to put the things back into the knowledge from uh, observations, that's a lot of work in its own right. But we hear you, Corey. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Okay, if nobody is saying that, let me just add my two cents. So I, I think the, if you look at your uh, title, right, I think you're basically making the case that the combining two kinds of knowledge is uh, important and beneficial. So what I would like to see maybe in the final dissertation is, so you identified three separate uh, tasks, so extraction right. and mm -hmm. up to recommendation, right? Right. So for each of them, what we should do is to make a table which says, okay, declarative knowledge, this is what it does. Okay. And the probabilistic knowledge, this is what it does. So declarative knowledge is something that we can verbalize. Mm -hmm. Probabilistic knowledge is what we can get from data. Right. Then combining, you can, uh, make the case that they provide complementary information. Okay. Right. Declarative kind of stuff cannot be automatically gleaned from the data. And there are times when what you glean from the data is incomplete or is an error because the data is queued. <coughs> and then you make the case that declarative knowledge will help you improve that. Right. And, and so saying that both have their own uh, independent uh, existence and can be meaningfully combined and, and you are kind of doing it for a particular use case will make a very good story. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. And if anybody just want to say anything, uh, Sujan, do you want to say anything? Uh, yeah, so the motivating example was that there were external events in the context of cyber physical systems that was actually influencing the functioning of the cyber physical system itself. So in, from this work you can uh, see how external events, uh, because external events are complex, so there may be multiple external events that are influencing the power system or the power grid, so you may want to uh, have a framework to uh, lay out all the extracted events, first thing, and second thing, uh, you could make sense of how events are connected and how uh, that particular connection of events or chain of uh, events would influence the functioning of a power system. For example, to be specific, uh, if, you, if you, maybe I'll just go back to the slides quickly.
Uh, so Dr. Wang, so this is a slide uh, where I can uh, probably answer your question. So you hear these are the different events. Uh, sorry, these are the different events that are external to the power grid, right? So the temperature rise and somebody reporting about problems on uh, textual streams is outside the scope of the stability equations of the cyber-physical system itself. So the question is, the real world is really complex with such events. We can't really escape that. So in that case, right, we have to factor in those external events and compute what is the probability of failure. So here, this particular thing here is the power system. And power system being, uh, having a flashover is nothing but uh, a particular part of the power system has failed. Uh, because of a tree, for example, here in this case. And then you have some external events. So you, you kind of condition this uh, failure on external events to figure out uh, some estimates. And then you take action based on uh, these estimates. So for example, if you know that the person is, a, a, a person is reporting tree growth near a power, power line, so, and depending on uh, how severe it is, so that is the impact assessment part that I discussed. Depending on how severe it is, you can mobilize a unit to cut down the tree or trim the tree and things like that. So, did that answer your question? Okay, yes. Oh, okay. All right, guys, you guys are excused, and the committee can discuss this more.